Now, while on the technology beat, I often find myself reading and hopefully understanding Scientific American magazine. An article in the June issue alerted me to a life and death tragedy unfolding halfway around the world. Health reporter Kafi Drexel has more. That's right, Adam. One of the most recognizable cartoon characters that we all grew up with is actually in a fight for its own life. I'm here with editor-in-chief of Scientific American magazine, Mariette DeCristina, who can tell us more about this contagious cancer. Mariette, what's going on with the Tasmanian Devil? So the Tasmanian Devil, although we know this character is so beloved from the old Bugs Bunny films, is an actual creature who lives on an island just south of Australia called Tasmania. And the Tasmanian Devil has been fighting for its life because it has one of the very rarest of, of infections, an infectious cancer, which arose just 15 years ago and has now led to the elimination or death of about 95% of all Tasmanian devils alive today. How does this work? Because this is an ex infection of the face. This happens during contact with these animals. Yeah, it is an infection of the face, actually. And the reason why it happened and why it's such a rare thing is normally cancerous tumors in a body don't have a means to get into another creature, right? The tumors arise, they get to a certain size, and then they might begin to break off and travel and eventually will kill the creature, whatever has that cancer. But in the case of cancers and cells like that, those cells don't live outside the body body really well, so there's no way for those cancers normally to get from one creature to another. Another problem that cancers might face in trying to colonize another creature from one to another is that normally if an alien cell is in your body, your immune system springs into action and kills it. In the case of the Tasmanian devils, however, two things have conspired to block those normal cancer-fighting functions. First thing, Tasmanian devils, just like the Taz uh, that you've seen in cartoons, are kind of feisty creatures. So when they're fighting with each other, they bite, often on the face or even mating, they bite on the face. And when they do that, the, the first animal about 15 years ago that had this mutation that caused the cancer, was able to transmit it to another animal straight in. So you're going to say to me, well, okay, why didn't the cancer then just get killed by the other animal's immune system? Well, a funny thing happened to Tasmanian devils many years ago, probably through some giant colony collapse at some point. They're all very genetically similar. So that cancer cell, when it got transmitted straight from the mouth of one animal into the face of another, did not get recognized as a truly foreign cell by the other immune system. And as a result, those cancers sprung up in the next animal and they keep getting transmitted for the same reasons. So obviously this isn't an episode of Twilight and humans aren't necessarily biting each other on the face. What protects us from having these cancer spreading contagious cancers amongst humans or other animals? Well, right now it doesn't sound too likely, right? Because humans were very genetically diverse. There are lots of us all around the planet, but let me paint a scenario for you that'll have you thinking twice. In some areas where people's immune systems could be a little depressed, let's say in areas that have a lot of HIV rampant in them, and in areas where people may eat bushmeat, so they might eat apes that have, um, you know, that have been infected with cancers, let's say. So if you assume a low genetically diverse animal, like a chimpanzee, because it just doesn't have as many animals as there were once upon a time, so they're not as genetically diverse, and somehow a mutant cancer that can be transmitted among them could arise, and then if people were to eat that bush meat, it's possible. It's not likely, but it's possible. Are researchers and scientists trying to save our little buddy? Oh, absolutely. I mean, the animal is a, is a charming, feisty creature. It is the top predator in the areas of north, uh, west, northeast uh, Tasmania where it lives. And of course, you want the species to stay. So a couple of interesting things have happened. And it's hard to tell yet whether they're going to be good or bad for the Tasmanian devil. First of all, many different, or at least a few different strains of the cancer have arisen. So it could happen, as it has happened in other creatures, that if there are more strains, it could become, it could mutate into a chronic disease that doesn't kill the Tasmanian devils. Um, on the other side of it, it could become more lethal. But, but chances are uh, it could mutate into something that is a little less lethal for the animals and they could evolve to learn to live with it as a chronic condition. Wow. So this is, once again, shows the real connection. Yeah, absolutely. With, you know, it could happen, but luckily 
it seems like we're protected for now. Evolution is on your side. Yeah. Okay, you heard it first here. Back to you, Adam. <laughs> Now, even though the name of the show is It Ain't Rocket Science, we couldn't help but talk a little bit about the ins and outs of space travel with author Mary Roach on her new book, Packing for Mars. She's never orbited the Earth, but Mary Roach has the right stuff. I ask the questions that nobody wants to ask, <laughs> I guess. All to make it interesting for you and for me. And I want to get a sense that somebody is enthusiastic about the project and that they can communicate on my level, which is, let's be honest, seventh or eighth grade. In her current book, Packing for Mars, Roach looks at life on a spaceship, everything that occurs between liftoff and touchdown, communicating with past and present astronauts. I'm not doing anything scary. I just want to ask you some questions about stuff that I'm curious about that I think my readers might be curious about. Beyond booster rockets and payload doors, Mary examines the science that takes place inside the capsule allowing for the creature comforts, even, well, in zero gravity. In order to test the toilet, they had to make a fake poop, a, a really high fidelity fake poop. That This was some engineer's job. So really, the engineering challenges of something as simple as going to the bathroom are yeah. so fascinating to me. I mean, it's, it's silly and gross, but on the other hand, it's really interesting science. Despite writing about space travel, Roach's science is grounded and rational. Science is the world, it's your body, it's your dog, it's the weather. I mean, it's not boring, it's fascinating, and it's important to understand it. And in her book, Mary does a good job of getting that done. Welcome back. We are now north of the border in Canada at the Montreal Science Center, where we're going to take a look at a new high-tech exhibit that'll teach you some of the real-world lessons behind some of the neatest stuff you may remember from the Indiana Jones movie, some stuff that may actually inspire you to learn a little more about the science of archaeology. Let's go take a look. No need to close your eyes in order to protect yourself from demons and lightning bolts flying out of this Ark of the Covenant. This is just one of many props on display at the Montreal Science Center as part of a new exhibit by X3 Productions called Indiana Jones and the Adventure of Archaeology. Lucasfilms has these amazing archives. So they had all these objects from the movies that were just sitting there in the archives and not having anybody look at them. So I think they put one and one together and decided they want to start um, finding a way to see how uh, Indiana Jones could become an, an introduction to the world ar archaeology. And since pretty much every object at the center of every movie is based on an artifact from the real world, what better way to make that introduction than to make links between the movie props and the actual items? Now, as soon as you enter, you get this little digital handheld that not only guides you through the exhibit, but we'll also remind you of key scenes in the movies that line up with the artifacts in case you haven't seen the movies in a while. The exhibition is really half and half. It's half about uh, the movies of Indiana Jones and it's half about the science of archaeology. Um, it was important for us to be able to cover both aspects because they're both interesting in different ways and they actually complement each other. So this exhibition is kind of um, designed like a mirror effect. So in, in the main section you're talking about Indiana Jones, you're in the world of props, you see all of the costumes, the artifacts that were used in the movies. And when you get into the content, that's when you learn um, the real stories and the real archaeology behind um, the movies and behind the props that you see. Then you've got these other spaces that are really just about the real world archaeology. And in there, we make links to Indiana Jones. So we say, like, like Indiana Jones, you know, real world archaeologists today and even in the past, um, they did search for treasures. They did analyze the objects that they, that they found. They did go on adventures and go on sites to explore. And in order to help the exhibit hit closer to home, it literally brings you some pieces from the past from the exhibit's home, wherever it happens to be. As you've gone through the exhibition, you've traveled to all the different locations that Indiana Jones has traveled. But then what's happening here? I mean, visitors are here in Montreal, and there is archaeology that, um, is, that, is, that happens right here. We're in the old part of the city of Montreal, and there's a lot of digs that were just done, actually, just a couple feet from the museum here. And every time the exhibition changes city, the content for the last section is going to uh, change. So you'll be able to see the treasures of the different locations where the exhibition is going to travel. As of now, it looks like Montreal is the closest the exhibit will get to us since there are no plans to bring it to the U.S., at least not yet. It'll be just north of the border until September 18th, after which it heads to Europe and Asia. Well, thanks for watching today, Rocket Science, and actually, it really wasn't. Now, going forward, if you or someone you know is interested in programs that explore science, technology, engineering, and math, you can check out Time Warner Cable's connectamillionminds.com.
That about wraps it up. I'm Adam Balkin. Good night.